This episode of Get Real Health is a continuation of my conversation with Drs. Blooming and Tavers about menopausal hormone therapy. Today, Dr. Blooming helps explain the options and the lingo in hormone therapy, from bioidenticals to Premarin to patches. He also explains why women should be leery of compounded prescriptions. We'll be taking a closer look at the notorious Women's Health Initiative study, both what it was and how it was misinterpreted, leading to widespread fears around the world that still persist. Dr. Avram Blooming is a hematologist and medical oncologist who's passionate about studying the benefits and risks of hormone replacement therapy. He dedicated his career to treating women with cancer and advancing cancer research. Dr. Blooming is a clinical professor emeritus at USC and holds an MD from the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Together with Dr. Carol Tavris, Dr. Blooming wrote a book called Estrogen Matters, which strives to help women make an informed decision about hormone therapy. I can't re recommend this book or their website enough for anyone looking to boost their understanding of this topic. Both are loaded with scientific resources. Unfortunately, Carol Tavris was able to join us today, but I hope you'll check out part one of our conversation to get her insightful perspectives as a social psychologist, a feminist, and a skeptic. Let's dig in. Welcome to Get Real Health. I'm your host, Dr. Chana Davis. This show cuts through the noise to give you science-based insights from real experts so that you can make smart, healthy choices. Welcome to the show again, Dr. Blooming. Thank you so much for taking the time to continue our conversation about hormone therapy. My pleasure, Chana. So what I was hoping to do today is to dig a little bit more deeply into some of the common questions because this term hormone replacement therapy is pretty broad and encompasses a lot of different options. So I was hoping we could dig into that. And I also wanted to spend a little time on the next layer um, of the Women's Health Initiative study and to help allay some of the fears that that study sparked. So in, our, in the first conversation, we, we did talk in more general terms about sort of the risk benefits of hormone replacement therapy for menopausal women. But, you know, in a relatively brief conversation, you can't get into all that nuance. So this is for those who want a little bit more of the gory details. Um, I wonder if maybe you can start with what, what some of the common questions that you encounter from women, and then maybe I can layer on top of that some of the ones that have come from those who have viewed my posts about the first po um, podcast and some of my own personal questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. So, so what are some of the questions that come up most often as women decide that it's at least something they want to consider? Um, so actually, sorry, now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if the best way to start is to sort of just lay out all the different modalities that, that exist that women might want to be choosing from. Well, let's start by keeping it simple, but we can go into as much detail okay. as you want. Okay. Okay. First, hormone replacement therapy, which some people call menopausal hormone therapy, yes. really relates to estrogen. As mm. Carol mentioned at our last meeting, at the time a woman reaches menopause, usually between the ages of 45 and 51, the level of circulating estrogen plummets. Within five years, it's down to 1% of what it had been before she entered menopause, mm -hmm. as opposed to testosterone in men, which falls gradually. There is mm -hmm. not that kind of precipitous fall in men. So that Hormone replacement therapy is also and primarily estrogen replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. The reason it gets confusing is we know when estrogen replacement therapy was widely used in the 1970s, it was found that there was a dramatic increase in the risk of uterine cancer, also called endometrial cancer because it starts in the lining of the uterus that's called the endometrium. And there was a drop in the use of estrogen replacement therapy at that time, because obviously we didn't want to induce any kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. And then about four years later, it was determined that if a woman gets progesterone as part of her hormone replacement therapy, that increased risk of uterine cancer is eliminated. Mm -hmm. And so hormone replacement therapy now for a woman with a uterus 
is estrogen plus some form of progesterone, two female hormones. Mm -hmm. And for a woman who does not have a uterus, it is generally estrogen alone. There are some people who recommend progesterone even for women without a uterus. Mm. That is not mainstream recommendations mm -hmm. and most organizations of respected specialists do not advise that. That's an excellent clarification that we're mostly using this to refer to replacing what's sort of a normal level of estrogen. I want to bring up yes. a term that uh, you probably hear a lot about, uh, which is bioidenticals. Sure. Bio, bioidentical really came out uh, not long after the Women's Health Initiative said uh, hormones are bad for you. And we ought to go into that in more detail, and we will. But when they came out with that in 2002, and the number of prescriptions for hormone replacement therapy fell precipitously, it represented a commercial niche so that drug manufacturers could say, well, sure, the drugs they used in the Women's Health Initiative maybe did damage, so let's go to something that is natural. Mm -hmm. That's a buzzword, but it's mm -hmm. appealing, and we'll call it bioidentical. Bioidentical simply means, I told you that estradiol is the most, uh, the highest concentrated estrogen in the body of a premenopausal woman. Bioidentical means estrogen. It could be estrogen that comes from a yam, but it's estrogen. Uh, whereas estrogen that comes from a horse, because it contains more than just estradiol, isn't bioidentical. And the selling pitch, although they couldn't say this, was bioidentical is safer. It's not true. The, and many drug companies there, therefore started to produce what they labeled bioidentical uh, hormone replacement, which is just estradiol, uh, mm -hmm. to market it. Uh, and if it is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States and produced by a well-respected drug manufacturer, I have no problem with that. That's fine. The problem I have is there are many, many people who have said, well, come to me and I'm going to prescribe just the dose you need based on tests that I'm going to do on you. And I will then have a local pharmacy compound what you need so that it will be tailor made to your needs. And that's a scam. That's not valid. Uh, the studies that have been done on what are called compounded bioidentical hormones have shown that there is little or no quality control. You're not sure what dose you are getting with that. There are no long-term studies looking at that. And so the term bioidentical I think has no place in this kind of a clinical discussion. It is a marketing term, not a scientific term. And the data behind it do not support the reported, reported is the word, wrong word, the claimed benefits of people who are prescribing compounded bioidentical hormones. What do you say to women who say, I'm taking them and they work wonders for me, so why should, should I stop? I mean... If, it's, if it is a reputable pharmaceutical prescription and it's working for you, mm -hmm. fine. If it's compounded bioidentical by your local pharmacy, and I think many local pharmacists are very ethical people, Mm -hmm. But the studies that have been done on this, and they're not many, show no consistent quality control. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. And mm -hmm. what I find is there are people who use bioidentical like a flag. And I have been talking to people who will get up and harangue me for not recommending bioidentical hormones. Well, wait a minute. 
I, I'm not objecting to them if there is good quality control, but I am alerting you that if you have a compounded bioidentical estrogen, you are taking something that is not quality control. And I wouldn't recommend that for anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's put the emotion aside and mm -hmm. let's just look at what we know and try to do the safest and most beneficial thing we can. And that means using FDA, and I refer to that because I work in the United States, Food mm -hmm. and Drug Administration approved preparations mm -hmm. and compounded bioidentical hormones are not currently approved by the FDA and won't be until some form of quality control is instituted. And I know pharmacists who are working to make that happen. That's fine. But until it happens, I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. But do, do women normally go through a process of trying to figure out what the right, right dose is? And you, could you do that with a regulated compound as well, a regulated formulation, and say, maybe I need two pills, or I don't really know how it works, but... Sure. sure. I'm Premarin, for example comes as 0.3 milligrams, 0.4 milligrams, 0.625 milligrams, 0.9 okay. milligrams, and 1.25 milligrams. Okay. But you know that when it says that on the bottle, that is the dose that is being administered. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you can work with your physician to establish a dose that works best for you mm -hmm. using, in a, a personal situation, the symptoms that you are trying to relieve. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. How do you kind of approach what's the right one for you, well, I guess? There are different forms of estrogen replacement. Uh, the one that's used most commonly is the pill. Uh, there is a form of a patch that can be used as estrogen replacement. Uh, and the dosing is different. And we'll talk just a minute about serum levels, which can be measured, and whether or not they're of any use. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just uh, say that the benefit for the patch, which is skin absorption of estrogen, is it's associated with a lower risk of thrombophlebitis, which means clots that develop in veins. The risk with the pill is very small. It's less than 5%, but the risk with the patch is even less than that. So when you say the pill, to me, I think the birth control pill. Do you mean an oral version of hormone therapy when you say the pill? Thank you, Thank you for that. That is correct. I mean oral estradiol, the most commonly prescribed pill, uh, certainly in the United States, I'm not sure in Canada, is Premarin. Premarin was developed by Wyeth, uh, sold to Pfizer. Premarin has been in use for over 65 years. We have the most information about hormone replacement therapy, estrogen replacement therapy, dealing with Premarin simply because it's the one that's been used longest and has been studied the longest. Mm -hmm. uh, the Premarin name is actually an acronym for pregnant mare urine. That's mm -hmm. what it is taken from. And after you get over your repulsion at that, uh, there are people who are against estrogen who will say that, well, if you want to take a pill that tastes like urine, sure. Well, okay. in order to deal with that, I actually bit into a Premarin pill. And there's, there's no taste. Uh, there are people who object to the way mares are treated to collect it. I've heard both sides. I've heard people say that they are uh, chained in their stable and hooked up to a catheter system. I've heard other people talk about uh, they are allowed to go free and the urine is collected periodically. In truth, I don't know uh, mm -hmm. which of those is more valid. But I do know that we know more about that preparation than any other form of hormone replacement therapy. And the reason I have used that preferentially is simply because we have the most data, both in terms mm -hmm. of benefit and in terms of safety, using that approach. Mm -hmm. Mm 
-hmm. In terms of dose, circulating level of estradiol, which is the most prominent estrogen in a premenopausal woman, mm -hmm. uh, is very variable. And there are many authorities who say that you really shouldn't titrate the level of estradiol. If you're going to titrate any circulating hormone level, the one to titrate is the follicular stimulating hormone, mm. which is called FSH. This is a hormone that is produced by the pituitary gland and stimulates the ovary in a premenopausal woman to secrete estrogen. Mm. When the estrogen level falls because the ovary stops producing it, the FSH level goes up dramatically. And mm -hmm. that is probably the most reliable circulating mm -hmm. hormone to measure to see if you are replacing the estradiol to its premenopausal level. Right. Many people suggest not doing that. And when I say people, I mean respected medical authorities without going into a lot of article citations. And what we've done in the study I did on hormone replacement therapy in women with previously treated breast cancer uh, is we did measure the FSH levels so that mm -hmm. we knew we were giving what we felt was an adequate replacement dose. But the most sensitive indicator of how effective the dose we were giving was, was we titrated it against 23 symptoms that mm -hmm. are characteristic in a menopausal woman. Mm -hmm. And we found that although there was reasonably good correlation, the best therapeutic goal was to make sure that the symptoms were relieved. Yeah. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense to, to titrate the dose to symptoms. But what if you're thinking, if your main objective is longer term health benefits, then how do you approach this titr titration? There is not a great deal of information that links that kind of circulating hormone level with benefit. Most of the studies, uh, the epidemiologic studies showing that estrogen decreases the risk of heart disease and osteoporotic hip fracture and Alzheimer's disease by uh, as much as 50% are done without correlating with circulating hormone levels. So that one could extrapolate and say, well, I am going to look at circulating hormone levels, but there isn't the medical literature that supports your doing that. The benefits seem to occur in women who are taking hormones, even without that particular parameter being followed. So does the, did the WHI st study, which we'll get into more detail, but do some of these large studies, do they typically just standardize, give everyone the same dose or, or everyone... How does that work? In, in... The WHI, which is the largest study of this we know of, gave everyone the same dose. Okay. They gave them 0.625 milligrams of Premarin, and they gave uh, progesterone, uh, which is not being recommended anymore, and we can get into that in more detail. It, it prevented uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that is recommended currently is Prometrium, which is a form of micronized progesterone, and Prometrium in a dose of either 100 milligrams a day or mm -hmm. 200 milligrams days 16 through 25. Mm -hmm. And the reason there are those options is there are people who recommend giving the same dose of estrogen and progesterone every day while a woman is taking hormones. And obviously that's good for women because what they will say is, well, the one really good thing about reaching menopause is I don't have to worry about menstrual periods anymore. Mm -hmm. And you take it every day, there usually are no periods. Uh, there are people, and I am among them, who have uh, recommended as a first attempt cyclical hormone therapy, which was 0.625 milligrams of Premarin daily from days one through 25, and mm -hmm. 200 milligrams of Prometrium daily from day 16 through 25, and then nothing for five days, so that periods generally continued. And the reason for that was an attempt to squeeze out whatever even minimal benefit I could get from the hormones and minimal safety and an extensive 
exhaustive review of the literature suggested that that was both the most effective and the safest. But the difference is so small, I would not make a strong case for one approach over the other. Mm -hmm. And it brings up a really interesting paradox that physicians face all the time. When you consult a physician, you want to be convinced that that physician knows just what is best for you mm -hmm. and is certain of it. Mm -hmm. And if the physician is a scientist, he or she knows that they know so little and they must be uncertain with every conclusion they reach. And somehow a physician has to walk a line between being reassuring, mm. but being humble enough not to arrogantly claim absolute knowledge. Yeah. Okay, are, are there any other questions that you commonly get um, about women who are saying, I'm thinking about it, you know, what about this, what about that? Well, the most common one is, I'm so confused. Who can I believe? Mm -hmm. I, I hear so many things and I don't know what to believe. Yeah. And the question, of course, is why should they believe me mm -hmm. or anybody else? And the reason we wrote the book with such extensive scientific references is to say, don't take our word for it. Don't take mm -hmm. anybody's word for it. Mm -hmm. If you're really interested, and not many people are really interested in looking at the hard data, but thanks to Carol, uh, the, the data are presented in an easy to understand way. Mm -hmm. And every chapter of our book ends with a take home message. So if you just wanna look at that, you can just look at mm -hmm. that. And if your physician doesn't agree with what you're asking for, ask the physician to read the book and talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. And we have criticized in the medical literature, both in a favorable way and an unfavorable way, the studies that have come out that have generated headlines that mm -hmm. confuse women. Yeah. For example, the Women's Health Initiative. Yeah. Why the Women's Health Initiative? Because it's a billion dollar study. There is no study that has ever cost that much money and there is extensive data. And the Women's Health Initiative really is the result of work by Bernadine Healy. Bernadine Healy, who sadly is no longer alive, was a cardiologist and was the first and thus far the only director of the United States National Institutes of Health. And what she said is most medical studies are done on men. And then mm -hmm. the results are extrapolated to women who are sort of like men, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And that's unfair to women. Mm -hmm. uh, men are different from women and women are different from men in many good ways. And to extrapolate the results of a study on men to women can and is in certain situations harmful. And so she wanted studies that specifically targeted women on women's issues. Mm -hmm. And the Women's Health Initiative came out of that. And at the time, uh, in 1995, Bernadine Healy wrote a book in which she said, when I turn menopause, based on what I know, I will start hormones without a blink. She was a professor of cardiology. She knew about the benefits vis-a-vis -vis the heart, the brain, the bones, she knew about at that time, no significant risk of breast cancer associated with estrogen. And she wanted to make sure that we had data to support those studies that were available. Mm. And so she helped organize and launch and worked very hard to get the Women's Health Initiative. Mm. And then in July of 2002, the first results of the Women's Health Initiative came out. And they came out, not as an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is where the manuscript was reported, they came out as a headline. That's very rare in medicine. Before 
any study reaches the public vis-a-vis -vis headline, physicians usually can see the article and go over it and help counsel people who ask them about it. Mm -hmm. But this was done as a headline because, and this is what the lead Women's Health Initiative investigator said, we wanted to make as big a splash as possible. Well, they certainly did. They came out and they said, we thought that estrogen decreases the risk of heart disease, decreases the risk of dementia, decreases the risk of bone fracture, and does not have any effect on breast cancer. And what we found, horrors, was it increased the risk of heart attacks and strokes and dementia and breast cancer. And so we thought it was urgent that we come out with this headline, which came out a week before the article came out. Mm -hmm. But when my patients heard it and they called me, I had no article I could read. Mm. Well, I did read the article and many people did. And what we found is the following. Yes, there was a small but real increased risk of heart attacks and dementia and stroke. And I mean, really small. I mean, like stroke was 12 in 10,000 women who got it. And stroke wasn't defined as hemiparalysis. It was defined even as uh, a period of difficulty speaking that might last for a few hours. But, and this is the most important thing, the median age, the average age of the women who were entered into the Women's Health Initiative was 63. Well, menopause usually starts between the ages of 45 and 51. And in fairness, you can say, well, the reason they chose, chose 63 is they wanted to get an answer as quickly as possible. And they thought if they took women who were 45, it would be decades before they saw whether estrogen really helped prevent heart attacks and strokes mm. and dementia. And they would have a higher risk population at age 63. And that's why they chose that. Just yes. hold, hold tight for a second, on, on, just to clarify the study design. So these, you had women, 63-ish um, on average, who have never been on hormone replacement therapy. Some went on it, some didn't. No. Some had it, some didn't have it, some were randomized to go on it, some didn't work. Okay. So they, there, were, there, there was the, those who took it, those who didn't as part of the trial, but there was a mixed history prior to that as well. Exactly right. Okay. But the important thing with the 63 and the majority of women in this country didn't take hormone replacement therapy at that time. So it might be fair to say, fair to say that the majority of both patients who were randomized to take it and patients who were randomized to a placebo hadn't taken it before. But as you mentioned, these were mixed populations. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. And we now know that estrogen, if given to women who already have narrowed blood vessels, can increase the risk, at least for a year, of blockage of those blood vessels. And nobody is recommending that if estrogen is going to be started, it be started at age 63. When the data from the Women's Health Initiative was reanalyzed, it was found if you look at women who are within 10 years of their last menstrual period, in fact, what we had believed about estrogen before was still true. Estrogen decreased the risk of heart disease, decreased the risk of dementia, and both studies said it decreased the risk of bone fracture. So the 2002 readout and headlines, that was how many years into the study? Uh, about five. Okay. I see. So you're saying that at, at five years, it, there were some sort of causes for concern, some things going in the direction you didn't expect. And then when you looked it 10 years later, hmm? it was an absolute exclamation. Stop the hormones. Yeah. It's killing people. Yeah. And what we now know is if the hormones are given the way they had been given in the past, started within 10 years of the last menstrual period, uh, in fact, 
it prolongs life by at least three and a half years, decreases the risk of heart disease, decreases the risk of dementia. And the Women's Health Initiative, 18 years later, in 2020, published an article saying just that. Mm -hmm. The other thing they said, and this is what generated most of the headlines, is it raises the risk of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to get women's attention, just climb up on a, a, a platform and yell breast cancer, and you'll have women who, who will pay attention. Except when you look at the data, again, a week after the headline came out, the data show that estrogen alone doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer. And in fact, 17 years after the Women's Health Initiative, when they looked at their data, after causing prescription rates to drop precipitously, mm -hmm. they found that estrogen alone decreases the risk of breast cancer by a third. Mm -hmm. Didn't stop the headline. So, and, it, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, well, the one, the one other thing is what they say now and what they said in this recently published article, 17 years after their initial hysterical scream, mm -hmm. which by the way, they said, you know, we were probably over enthusiastic. Yes, I'll say. Uh, what they say is, even though estrogen alone not only doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer, it appears to decrease the risk of breast cancer. The combination of estrogen and progesterone, as we reported in 2002, increases the risk of breast cancer, and we still see that 17 years later. And that also, Chana, is not true. What do I mean not true? Mm -hmm. Well, in 2002, shortly after that first article was published, I invited one of the senior investigators of the Women's Health Initiative to come to my hospital and talk to the medical staff, and he did. And at the end of his talk, one of the doctors stood up and said, I'm just an ENT physician, ear, nose, and throat. He didn't say, I also have a PhD in mathematics. He said, but it seems to me that the numbers that you just presented to us, the numbers on the basis of which prescriptions for hormones fell around the world are not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Statistical significance is a mathematical test that is done on data. And if you show that the likelihood that the finding you are reporting is less then 20% likely you believe that that's a statistical significant difference. Mm -hmm. So it's one in uh, less, you know, one less than one in one in 20, less than a 5%, not mm -hmm. 20%. If, if the likelihood is that this wouldn't have happened if you didn't give the medicine, mm -hmm. the likelihood that is one in 20 that it wouldn't have happened. Uh, then you can call that statistically significant. Yeah. And in fact, the data presented didn't satisfy that. Yeah, that, that was one and of the so, messages, I think, that I really, um, that really resonated with me because you see this all the time, sort of, um, it's, it's, I think it's hard, there's a lot of people struggle to have intu like an intuitive sense of statistics and this idea that things can be different just by chance and that, you know, it's actually more unlikely that they're exactly the same, um, is a bit hard to wrap your head around. Sure. But as I mentioned, even then, estrogen alone didn't increase the risk of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. it, the headline in the New York Times was hormone replacement therapy, whether it's estrogen alone or the combination, mm -hmm. does increase the risk of breast cancer without specifying, well, wait, we didn't find that estrogen alone did, and mm -hmm. we now know, 17 years of follow-up, estrogen alone decreases the risk of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But even the combination of estrogen and progesterone that they reported increased the risk of breast cancer, that result was not statistically significant. And so the mm -hmm. senior investigator said to this ENT physician, you know, this is the biggest study ever done. 
we will never get a billion dollars to do another study like this. So if we think we have found something and the numbers don't quite add up, the statistical police are asked to leave the room. That is offensive in the extreme. There was absolute silence in that medical audience and no additional questions. Having yeah. said that, I told you that seven, and in 2004, they published a follow-up where there was borderline statistical significance. It satisfied the mathematical test barely. In 2006, they published another article where that borderline statistical significance had disappeared, mm -hmm. but that never made headlines. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, when they reported the follow-up, they still said that the combination, when we look at all the data, show an increased risk of breast cancer. And the reason that is not true is if you look at the data, you see that estrogen alone didn't increase the risk of breast cancer, and that's been a consistent finding. The combination reportedly had an increased risk of breast cancer, but in fact, when you compare the risk with estrogen alone, with the risk of estrogen and progesterone, they are exactly the same. The same, the graphs are superimposable. What is the difference? Each study had a control group and the control group for the estrogen progesterone group, the group that got placebo mm -hmm. was lower than expected. Hmm. It was much lower than the control group for the estrogen alone group. And can so I see if I get, like, can I see if I got all the groups right? It's like you've got group A, which is no hormones, and group like A plus, which is let's add estrogen only, and you've got group B, which is no hormones, and group B plus, which is estrogen plus progesterone. Yes. And A and B both had no hormones, but they didn't have the same cancer rate. That's so right. So you have a different comparator for like B. B. B's comparator actually had lower cancer than A, so therefore even though A and A plus and B plus had the same uh, cancer rate there was a, a lower rate that they were being compared to in the B. Which situation. raises the question, why did the control group against which the combination estrogen progesterone was compared mm -hmm. have a lower than expected breast cancer rate? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, you had asked me at the beginning, did any women randomized to controls take hormones before yeah. they were started on the control? And the yeah. answer is yes that group had a reasonable number of women who had taken hormones before being randomized to take placebo. Mm. And they caused the control group incidence to be lower than expected. Hmm. When you eliminate those women from that control group, the reported increased risk, same with the combination, vanishes. Yeah. So I get, I, was, I, go ahead, sorry. That was published finally in 2018 hmm. by Howard Holders and Phil Sorrell from USC and from Yale. And the investigators of the Women's Health Initiative know that. They know that study. Mm -hmm. And in spite of that, when they wrote afterwards, we still see this increased risk. They're simply ignoring data yeah. that we recognize. So I think a lot of listeners today are, are probably, you know, very laser focused on, so what does this mean for hormone therapy? And, and I think the answer is, you know, it's that the, the WHI conclusions were overly alarmist and, and there was a lot of sort of inappropriate statistics applied to them. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just trying to add on another layer of, you know, what does this tell us about the process of science and being a sort of critical consumer of science news. And I think one of the themes is, you know, to be mindful of statistical significance, of course, and that's, you know, you have to re actually read the paper to look at the, the p-values, but to be aware of that. And the second is just the control group, because I think you so often you see either there's no control group. I mean, sometimes you can get away with, get away with that, or you can have... Um, a control group that uh, sometimes the differences are actually explained by the fact that the control group was not a, an, a really an appropriate control group. 
And uh, what was the third? The third thing is, is the study population actually representative of you and of reality, which is in the WHI, it wasn't because it was women starting 10 years, 13 years after menopause. Well, more, all valid results. Yes, all valid points. The, I think the most obvious example of the distorted approach of the Women's Health Initiative investigators is the year after they published the first alarmist reports, mm -hmm. they came out with another study saying that hormone replacement therapy has no beneficial effect on quality of life. Hmm. And that was headlined in the New York Times. Not only does estrogen cause all these bad things, it doesn't even help the things we thought it helped. Well, and so you read the article because that's very important. Yeah. And what the article says is we know that symptomatic women would not enter a prospective randomized trial where they might be randomized to a sugar pill mm. and that wouldn't help their symptoms. And if they had been randomized to a sugar pill, they would drop out of the study. So what we did is we purposely chose against symptomatic women entering the study. Right. And what we found when we compared the women who weren't symptomatic, who got hormones, to the women who weren't symptomatic, who didn't get hormones, we saw no beneficial effect on the symptoms that these women never had. Right. And that was the headline. Mm -hmm. How disgraceful that is. Now, the Women's Health Initiative have published and said, the best treatment for menopausal symptoms is hormone therapy. They have walked back every single conclusion that they came to without saying we were wrong. They walk it back and say, good news. Well, mm -hmm. yes, but a lot of that is because you gave us such mm -hmm. corrupt news in your first publication. And then the question is, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, Bernadine Healy, whom we mentioned at the beginning, wanted studies fairly evaluated on women. Why did this happen? And you read, I told you that the first article of the Women's Health Initiative came out in July of 2002. In 1996, Jacques Rousseau, who is a cardiologist and was the primary principal investigator of the Women's Health Initiative, wrote an article saying, it's time we put a stop to the HRT bandwagon. Hmm. Really? And this is the impartial person who chaired this huge study to validate or invalidate yeah. what we thought about hormones. It's disgraceful. Yeah, that, that's another piece of advice I've dispensed is to be aware of the author's perspectives in advance. Of you know, course. sometimes you can get a hint of that from the conflicts of interest or the funding, but you could sometimes you have to dig more deeply and to see, you know, just the, what's the body of what's what have been their positions that they've sort of been built their careers on, and are they going to be willing to abandon that if if the study says otherwise? Carol Tavers, my co-author, at this point feels it's always very important for us to say we have no link to pharmaceutical companies. Nobody paid us to write this book. Mm. This is really done because of our concern about the miscommunication that yeah. is seriously impacting women's lives. Mm -hmm. So we should probably wrap it up here and leave people with um, information where they can learn more. What would you recommend for women that are, uh, you know, feeling confused? And they're, obviously your book is awesome and you have a great website. I love that you have so much science and resources on your website. Um, any other resources in terms of menopausal societies or other, uh, you know, bodies to turn to? Sure. I mean, there's the North American Menopause Society, NAMS. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is uh, interested in giving women the best possible advice. Mm. Uh, they also have a website, and I think it's nams.org. Mm -hmm. uh, they put updated information in there, 
And they also have sites, for example, we get uh, calls from people all over the world, really, but uh, in the United States, women say, how can I find the doctor who's informed enough to discuss this with me and not simply dismiss my concerns? Mm -hmm. And the North American Menopause Society, from their website, provides a service where if you will put in your zip code, they will give you the uh, contact information for uh, OBGYN physicians who are well informed about what going through menopause entails mm -hmm. and what might be the best way to deal with that. Okay. Well, I really appreciate your, uh, all the work you're doing on your mission to help women make informed choices. Thank you so much for, for writing the book um, and for, you know, for taking the time to talk today. It's always a pleasure, China.